Manchester City Improving Daily Projects isn't anything to do with my current research. Um, this was a case study in my master's um, that I just completed recently in Manchester. Um, and in, in the context of the theme of multidisciplinarity and diversity, um, I, I guess it fits. There's some archaeology in there. Um, the project was a funded project through the Arts Council and the Heritage Lottery Fund, and I was the named archaeologist on the HLF bid, so in that respect, there is archaeology in here. And it was archival research to do with um, the content of the ballads, which I'll come on to in a minute. Um, so, the Manchester Improving Daily Project. I will just initially play a little clip, um, which is this. Can I just interrupt before you start? Did you, did you um, oh, does it? Yeah. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Right, so the project, as you can hear there, um, isn't um, traditional 18th, 19th century work songs in that respect, um, but it was a, a multidisciplinary approach to interpreting the, this collection of ballads um, that stem broadly from the Industrial Revolution. Um, they're not a formal collection. This folio of what's now called Manchester Ballads was done in the 1980s by two folk singers who were also historians, and they're sort of facsimiles of penny broadsides that were gathered together as a collection, which became known as the Manchester Ballads. So rather like the Celts, say, back in the day, it wasn't a recognisable thing when they were made. There were no Manchester Ballads produced and sold. They were just penny broadsides. They looked like that, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, sold for 1p in the markets and pubs. Um, but there's now a collection um, gathered together there, but also at Chetham's and at the John Rylands Library and various other um, archives. Um, where you can find these these ballads, which tell you quite a bit about um, what people were thinking, the way they were acting, because it was a largely pre-literate society, um, and and these penny broadsides stem from a time when there weren't newspapers, for example. So um, to distribute thoughts and um, reviews of events or publicise forthcoming events. It was a, a method of communicating with people en masse who would hear these song in pubs and markets and so on. Um, and it was a way of disseminating information. This one here, um, the original of which is at um, the library in Manchester, is called A New Song on the Great Demonstration which is to be made on Curzel Moor, September the 24th, 1838, which is a snappy title um, and then there's a lot of verses essentially it's a rallying cry it's a call to arms for chartists um, about a demonstration some of them are like that they're kind of <laughs> publicity material almost for events and social movements and some of them are, are a reflection on things that have been so there's one about Peter Lou for example now obviously um, is about an event that was rather than will be um, but they tell you kind of the unofficial narrative in a way because these were quite small scale um, industries that were often um, forged as well. There's quite a few of them that are scribbled out. The, the original printer's name is, is kind of taken off there and then they just resold as counterfeits, I guess you, you would call them, um, as a way of making money. Uh, so there's all sorts of different little biographies to these these things and, and the place where they were as well, which I'll come on to in a minute. So the project was... Um, it, well, it's ongoing actually. There's an album launch um, in February to do with a full album of these songs. Uh, we did an EP, which is the top right image there. Um, top left, some information posters and a talk that I did to accompany some of the live performances, um, as you can see there. And then there's some festival dates as well. So it was it was partly because it was a funded thing. We needed some outcomes, I guess, um, but also to to just inform people about the content of the ballads because it's it's a really interesting snapshot of what people were thinking, what they were saying and doing about current affairs um, back in the day. So multidisciplinarity in that it involves 
quite a few different strands coming together uh, live music spoken word presentations online content there will be um, a bigger and a more comprehensive uh, website once the project finishes but at the moment there's one on the Edward II website which is the band that's recorded these things so we've got a CD and a, and a book well booklet a 50 page book coming out in February uh, and as part of the research and the the thing for that we, we've kind of referred to, to these broadsides as a, a form of um, 19th century Twitter as it says that a social media because because they were they were they were not an official um, publication in fact some of the publishers as, as I said earlier went to great lengths to kind of hide um, their origins and they were quite controversial you know back back then publicizing industrial dissent or civic disobedience wasn't a popular thing to do so commercially they took a bit of a gamble by by producing these um, another side to this I suppose is um, the use of a funded arts venue that my, my MA was actually about a building in the northern quarter of Manchester that is now banned on the wall, it's a music venue. Um, and there's aspects of that that I went into about the fact that this acts as a hub, a sort of a special place where different, um, I suppose, disciplines can, can come together to, to do projects like this. And as a slight side issue, as austerity kind of sweeps the nation, um, you know, there, there are impacts for things like this in terms of just the chance conversations that can happen when with academics or artistic people come together. The project actually, the origins were that that book was given to the keyboard player of Edward II by the education officer at Band on the Wall. He just bought it on eBay. I got that one on eBay because it's out of print. Um, and said, oh, look at this book, these songs are really good. Albeit the language is quite arcane in the way they're written and some of them are quite rambling as well. Um, and Gavin was kind of, he's a keyboard player, was quite taken with them, looked into it and thought, well, we could record these mentioned it to me and I said well I could look into some of the context and then the project was born and, and has, has grown to fruition I guess. Um, as a slight side issue perhaps a bit more archaeologically um, based uh, it did highlight that there's an area of, if, I don't know well you know Manchester but New Cross is, is a less well known district of central Manchester just on the northern fringe um, and looking back, there's a real interesting bit of continuity about this. That there's a there's a retail theory called clustering, which is why you see car dealers together. I guess why you might get a lot of Indian restaurants in one place. Um, why you always see an Aldi outside of Tesco nowadays because people come together. And there's an element of that in in this area. Um, I would argue that New Cross. I've put there 300 years of descent. So that these ballads were made within a few hundred yards of where Band on the Wall is. Um, Band on the Wall is where this project was born. Um, they were sold at Shoot Hill Market predominantly, and, and then the pubs and clubs around there. This is about oh, four or five hundred yards from where Engels lived as well in, in the 18, 1900s. Um, so that area has always been, as I put there, on the edge of town, but quite an edgy part of town as well. I'd say there's a tradition of descent um, in this area that's kind of it's been overlooked. But when you look back through the archives, there's a definite, definite trend that you could argue this area has always been, well, on this map regression, everyone likes one of those, um, you can see that the top left, as you look at it, that's Manchester Cathedral, which is still there, um, Shoot Hills around the corner, so the, the, the area we're talking about, modern Swan Street, was a field uh, back then, and you can see the original medieval heart of Manchester. And if you follow that regression through, although Manchester's expanded exponentially since then that street is still very much on the border if you if you're in the town center and you get to the edge there swan street kind of down on the wall area you feel like you're on the edge of the city center now in every other direction you can walk for a mile or more and you still feel very built up that that still feels very edgy i'm not sure why probably the topography but it, it's just stayed as a kind of a boundary on the edge of things and it's it's that kind of a cultural quarter i guess now so um so there's a bit more about that in the book um, that will come out and there was a bit more in my MA about that kind of thing. Um, but for, for the purposes of this, so I'll move on to a bit more um, multidisciplinarity. So um, yeah, bringing together different people at a venue like that um, is important. When we've had the, the product launch, there was some coverage on the BBC News locally done quite a lot of festivals, there's hope for a, a nomination for a folk award, which will all sort of come to bring the content and the fact that these exist to a wider audience, which is one of the 
primary reasons for doing this project. And performance as heritage, you know, which Sam L. Giles has got a thing about, um, you know, there's actually merits academically in, in just doing the performance, being there at the time, people involving that, regardless of what's left behind afterwards, because things do get um, overlooked and ignored. You know, th these essentially were very nearly lost, um, scattered around, brought together almost by chance into that collection and subsequently I think this project has reinvigorated that. It's an ongoing thing to look through the archives in Manchester and, and find others and hopefully if this goes well and the, the CD sells as, as, as predicted, um, there'll, be, there'll be further work on that. Um, and it's just it's a, a different look at industrial Manchester uh, and the way people lived and all the kind of Engels thing and you know the social things behind that so uh, it's been a good project from that point of view. In terms of understanding the message I'm just going to play you two sound clips now again won't go into it here but there's there's a quite a bit of work about the cognition and the way people understand either song lyrics or poetry on the way it's sung so um, I'm going to play you two snippets of this which is the first verse there one is like a plain song version but somebody else involved in the project Jen Reed sings in we don't really know it's a bit like this this thing about um, in some of the other t sessions that's been mentioned here about not knowing really why people did what they did and how they did it because there's no written record we don't know how these sounded even just in the 1800s 1850s because there was no recording and although the tune is suggested often um, it's just a suggestion or there's no tune at all but Jen sings in a plain song way so unaccompanied probably quite close sight would have sounded in a pub or in a market and then I'll play you a little bit of the full band one as well um, and I'll try and do it with this on the screen oh, we'll see um, and it's interesting to just hear the it's, a, it's about Victoria Bridge which was a a street bridge over the airwell where there was a street market and all sorts of kind of other activities going on. So, um, have a listen. Travel or Manchester gravel will see many things to astonish his sight. But sure, he must notice wherever his court is, Victoria Bridge on a Saturday night. Such running and rushing, such jolting and pushing, it looked as though Babel had settled through spite. Or old Nick to go, what a tuck is a boat on, Victoria Bridge on a Saturday night. If trouble with physic, there are doctors with physic, their lozenges, boluses, poppies and pills. With ointment for drawing and backing for choring, with blister your chops to your red in the gills. And stuff for your noses and south for your toes, as a poultry and pigs pickle pork and police. With porkers and fenders and newspaper vendors and strep for glock puddings a penny apiece. His cab drivers calling and fish women bald in their quad fish and had a... Right, so she's singing unaccompanied. So we, we think that's probably how it would have sounded um, back in the day. Um, because there was a quite a tradition of unaccompanied sort of plain song as it's now called um, and you contrast that with this which is not the same get the idea. Um, but it's interesting how the same lyrics can just seem very different when presented in a different way. Uh, and one of the interesting things about doing this um, from a sort of an outreach point of view has been the reaction of people at the talks we've done sort of before and after the sets. Um, and just their understanding of the song seems to change um, and therefore hopefully the understanding of, of some of the social issues that face kind of industrial labor Mancunians. Um, so that's that's a summary of that. Um, so it was just a case study in, in my uh, masters, but one side issue: if you're going to get involved in a side in a project like this, it can be a bit distracting to your actual uh, <laughs> more academic things. Um, so uh, thanks for listening. Um, I was going to mention about austerity again. I have another rant about the toys, but I won't do that. So thanks to the Arts Council and the National Lottery as well because they they funded the project. Um, so there we go. Okay.